Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. I sat motionless as if paralyzed while my wife of 25 years explained to me why she was serving me with divorce papers. I could only hear half of what she was saying. Gary, are you listening to me? You look like you're in a daze. Pay attention. Okay, this is important. I'm sorry. I was distracted for a moment. What were you talking about? The terms are simple. There is nothing to dispute. I'm not asking for anything. Do you hear that? Absolutely nothing. You keep the house, the cars, and all the money in the bank. If you sign this, it's all over in three months. I didn't know what to say. Marcy and I have been married since high school. We raised two beautiful twin daughters, Cindy and Sandy, who went to Columbia University to study international banking. We had a nice house in the suburbs and we both drove Volvos. Marcy had her own credit cards and cell phone. I never denied her anything. I never cheated on her, never verbally or physically abused her. She never showed that she was unhappy or complained about anything. There was no way I could have prepared myself for this. I never noticed anything was wrong. Maybe that was the problem, I wasn't paying attention. I understand the mechanics of divorce, Marcy, but can you tell me why? It's probably too late to do anything about it, but I'd like to know why. Marcy sort of collapsed in the kitchen chair. It was obvious that she didn't want to discuss the reasons and hoped I would just sign the papers and let her go. Just tell me briefly, Marcy. What the hell did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong, Gary. You were the perfect husband. Sometimes I hoped you'd screw up and I'd have an excuse to leave, but you never did. You were great at raising the kids and getting them through college. You always gave me everything I wanted even if sometimes I was unreasonable. You bought me a beautiful house. My parents love you. Don't ever think you did anything wrong because you didn't. She looked all of 45. She had a nice complexion and perfect hair, light brown and glistening in the sunlight. She jogged regularly and her body was perfectly toned and tanned. On weekdays, she looked like a Land's End girl, but when she needed to, she was glamorous. Marcy was as perfect as I was, or so she claimed. I just couldn't figure out what was behind it. I'm sorry. It doesn't make sense. There has to be a reason. You can't just say it's okay and then walk away. There has to be a reason, Gary. I'm trying to do this in a way that doesn't hurt your feelings or make me look bad. Why don't we just leave it at that? No, Gary. I found someone else. He's a real estate developer. He has a beautiful apartment overlooking the river and a beautiful black Mercedes. He's handsome, rich, and madly in love with me. You were and still are a grocery clerk at the supermarket. I am not demeaning your job because you have always taken care of us and always earned enough to keep the family comfortable. However, you will always be a grocery clerk. I wanted more than that. I couldn't imagine you would do that for me. You were always happy with what you were doing and I didn't see you trying to improve. It was painful. I was the manager of the grocery department and she still thought of me as a clerk. When I had a chance to advance my career and move out of town, I turned down the opportunity to keep my family together. And now, look how I was rewarded. It was painful but not worth mentioning. Does this rich, good-looking guy have a name? Clayton Manning. He's the president of Keystone Development Company. How long have you known him? Six months. You slept with him? Marcy sat up straight in the chair. Her eyes darted around the room and finally she looked me in the face. Yes. I was trying to avoid the subject, but since you insist on it, yes. You were still married. Yes, I was still married. I cheated on you. I was an adulteress. I was a... Are you happy now? I sat for a while, then reached over and took the divorce papers, signed in three places, initialed two, and handed them to her across the table. I think he's better than I am. Sorry to disappoint you. I got up and as I was leaving the room, Marcy screamed, Hell no, that's not the reason. He wasn't better than you, just different. Don't you dare walk away believing that, Gary. Don't you dare? By then, I was out the door. I was so absorbed in my work and hobbies that I didn't even notice Marcy gradually moving her things out of the house. By the time she handed me the papers, she had moved most of her clothes and personal belongings into Clayton's apartment. She had thoughtfully left all the wedding and family photos behind so I could enjoy them in her absence. When I got back to the house, she was gone. Her Volvo was still in the driveway and I figured she wouldn't need it anymore. She had left a power of attorney on the kitchen table to sell the house and car. I spent the rest of the night getting rid of the beer that was in the refrigerator. 
By then, I realized that the job was done. There was no turning back and I didn't want to. Marcy was gone and would be gone the next morning. I called work and took three months of overdue vacation. They were always nagging me to take time off so there was no problem. I had plenty of vacation and sick leave. I quickly called the girls at school and briefly explained that we were breaking up but refused to give them any other information. They wanted to call Marcy but I didn't have her new phone number. I had three months to pull myself together and decide what I was going to do. I disconnected my landline, changed my cell phone number, and canceled the one Marcy had. The Volvo dealer gave me the low book value of Marcy's car. I had a high school friend, Terry Davis, who was now a real estate broker. He agreed to sell the house without a listing at a low price and with a quick settlement. To be sure, I canceled all my credit cards and opened new bank accounts. I cashed in my life insurance policies. It was time to put the house in order. I went around the house and collected everything that could possibly belong to my wife. There was enough stuff to fill three trash bags. I packed the girls' personal belongings into boxes and took them to the closet next to the house. I spent three hours sorting through family photos. I put all of the girls' pictures in a box for them. All the pictures of Marcy went in the trash can. It was stupid, I know, but I didn't care. The main problem I faced was a lack of direction. I had no idea what I would do after three months. Would I stay here or would I leave? Would I keep working or find something new? I had two hobbies. I collected coins, mostly cents with an Indian head on them. They were easy to collect and readily available. I bought and sold them on eBay and enjoyed it. My second passion was geocaching. It gave me an excuse to get outside and get some exercise. Marcy hated this activity because of the ticks, poison ivy, and having to walk. I didn't see how I could make a living doing any of these activities. When I wasn't busy with my hobbies, I spent time with the Wall Street Journal. Cindy and Sandy gave me a subscription every year at Christmas. I had no interest in stocks and bonds, but I read everything about farm commodities. I knew more about sugar, wheat, and corn than most market analysts. Of course, it was just a hobby. I had no money invested in any of it. I researched all available information about Keystone Development and Clayton Manning. Terry Davis was able to get more information about Clayton and his current project than I could. He cross-checked some of the information with a friend of his who works at a local commercial bank. I couldn't wait to see what he came up with. It had been weeks and all that time I hadn't seen or heard from Marcy. The girls called every week, but I hadn't heard from their mother either. I had a feeling they were on my side, but Marcy was their mother and I'm sure they had to be supportive to some degree. I had a few yard sales and unloaded a ton of stuff. I left enough furniture in the house that it would be good to show to potential buyers. Marcy and Clayton's picture was published in the society section of the Sunday paper. They were at a political rally, drinking wine with local figures. A few more weeks passed. Terry made me an offer on the house. It was pretty low compared to the appraisal, but they wanted to close the deal in 60 days, which would be perfect. He had an interesting biography of Clayton and wanted to talk about it. We made an appointment to meet for lunch. I decided to get out of the house for a while. I needed a break. Hayes Mountain was one of the best places in the area for hiking and geocaching. Unfortunately, I found all the geocaches there. However, there were three landmarks on the mountain. Landmarks are reference points placed throughout the country by government surveyors and real estate developers use these landmarks to determine property boundaries. They come in many forms but are usually metal rods driven into concrete. Finding landmarks is an interesting side game for serious geocakers. I decided that today I would manage to find all three landmarks on the mountain. In addition to the GPS, I would have to bring a metal detector with me. Finding a piece of rebar in the woods isn't easy and I needed all the help I could get. The GPS would lead me to the approximate area. Much of Hayes Mountain was part of the Madison Land Trust, approaching 2,000 acres. They were constantly looking to add to it. Subdivisions and industrial parks took up most of the vacant land and the trust had to survive on donations. Next to the trust's parking lot was an orchard and farmhouse with a large for sale sign. After parking the car, I walked over to the fence by the orchard just to have a look. It was embarrassing to think that in a little while this beautiful estate would probably be bulldozed to make way for construction. Are you going to buy it or just look at it? I couldn't help but smile at the old man walking toward me. He was dressed in overalls, but instead of a straw hat, he was wearing a John Deere baseball cap. He introduced himself as John Smurd. 
Well, if I had a million, I'd gladly take it from you. We both laughed at that. You won't have a problem selling it, will you? Well, I have people interested, but I try to hang on as long as possible. Why? I was hoping the land trust would buy it, but they don't seem to have the money. They want to leave the fruit trees in their natural state, which is fine with me. It doesn't please the developers who want to plant everything. I think it will be a great addition to what we have now. How can a land trust compete with the big companies? I've offered them a better deal. It's even worth a million in the listing, but I'll give it to the trust for $600,000. Trouble is, they don't seem to be able to raise that amount right now. If they can't do it in 90 days, I'll have to take the option away from that damn real estate developer. That son of a calls me every week and I'm getting tired of him. An option is not a sale, is it? No, the buyer purchases for me a promise to sell him the land in the next six months for a million. He pays $100,000 for the option. If he can't raise a million, he loses the option payment. It's a good deal for me, but I don't want him to get it. He has the million under lock and key, so he'll be safe. The problem is that he needs to get all six properties for the deal to go through. That's why he's willing to pay more than the place is worth. What happens if you don't sell him the option? He's going to lose his ass and more. Since the land trust can't raise the money, it looks like Keystone has a sure shot. However, if he doesn't get that lot, he'll lose the whole deal, including the money he paid for the options on the other five lots. That's probably around a million. His supporters will walk away and leave him hanging. If I had the money, I'd help you. Yeah, they all say that. We had another laugh and I left for my walk. I found his mention of Keystone interesting. The landmarks were within a mile of each other, that is, as the crow flies. On the mountain, it was twice that. The first two were fairly easy to find, they were standard surveyor markers. The last marker was much older and much harder to find. When I finally came upon it, I found a small brick monument with a bronze plaque attached to it. It was buried under years of leaves and debris. I took a picture of it to post with the magazine. In that moment, my life changed. The metal detector was still on. As I stepped away from the marker, it started beeping. It was faint, but it was definitely there. I put on my headset and began scanning the area about 10 feet south of the landmark. Finally, I pointed it at the target and carefully began probing. You don't usually find metal in the middle of the woods. In five minutes, I had a small iron box. It was wrapped in a heavily oiled piece of canvas. There was a lot of rust on the surface, but the box itself was sturdy. The lock was of heavy bronze, but it still did its job. Quite often, finds of this nature on public lands are considered treasures and should be turned over to the government or some historical agency. For some reason, that option didn't make sense to me today. I put the box in my bag and headed home. On the way home, I couldn't help but think about what was in my little box. Gold coins were the first thing that came to mind. Maybe it was full of important documents from the Civil War earlier. The possibilities were limited only by the size of the container. I cleaned off the kitchen table, pulled out the foster, and began to study my find. I didn't want to destroy the lock, but I couldn't figure out how to open it any other way. I had no idea if the mechanism inside the lock was still functioning. I decided that the lock would have to be sacrificed. My bolt cutter made quick work of the task. Inside the box was another piece of oiled canvas. I carefully unwrapped it and found 12 pennies. Why would anyone want to bury 12 pennies? These were not regular, everyday pennies, but old large cents. The newest date is 1814, the oldest was 1793. Despite the age, you could easily read the date on each one. Surprisingly, there was no green corrosion on them, which is common on old copper coins. I never got into collecting large cents, as I felt I could get more for my money by buying newer cents with Indian heads. However, I did have a book my grandfather left me called The Quirks of the Penny. It talked about the different types and varieties of large cent stamps. I found it boring since I didn't own any of them. It had been sitting on a shelf gathering dust for almost 30 years. Tonight, it would find a good use. I sat up until dawn with my grandfather's book and a magnifying glass. My scanner took beautiful high-resolution photos of each coin. Every crack and scratch on the stamp was perfectly visible and the condition of each coin was obvious. I slept until noon. I called work just to see how things were going. They told me that Phil Williams, one of the company executives, had asked about me. They didn't know anything else, but I had other concerns, so I didn't pursue it further. It would take a trip to the bank to get a safe deposit box. 
After spending a few hours on the internet, I realized that my panties were worth several million dollars. It wasn't about age, it was about their condition and the varieties of stamps. I now understood why drug dealers had to go to such lengths to launder money. There was no easy way to turn my precious coins into hard cash, it would have to be hard work. While having breakfast at IHOP, I noticed another picture in the paper of Marcy and Clayton at the opening of a new art gallery. She was wearing a black cocktail dress and holding a wine or champagne glass. They were both smiling at the camera. Looking at the photo, the next step became clear in my mind. After receiving the safe, I called John Smurd and asked him to hold off on making any decisions about the land for a few days. He seemed satisfied with the call. I went to the land trust office and asked how to make a donation to the organization. They were very happy to help me. We were four weeks away from the final divorce and for some reason, I felt like that deadline was very important. I spent the rest of the day researching coin dealers and auction houses. I wasn't looking for advertisements, I was looking for lawsuits. Eventually, I settled on Towers and Burns in New York City. They had a solid financial position and seemed to be able to handle controversial sales without much trouble or publicity. I made an appointment with them on Monday afternoon. I called the girls and asked them to keep Monday morning free so we could have lunch together. The facade of the Towers and Burns office was a chic showroom with plenty of glass and light. The display cases contained the standard variety of collectibles and the walls were hung with other numismatic paraphernalia. I gave my last name and was escorted back to a much less attractive part of the building. Welcome to New York, Mr. Simmons. I understand you have some interesting coins to show us. Is this your first time in the city? I sat down in the straight-back chair across from James Towers. His picture was in the advertisement, but he looked about 10 years older now. Thank you. My daughters attend Columbia University, so I've been here before but never on business. I'm not questioning your coin knowledge, but don't you have someone on your staff who specializes in early copper coins? If so, I think their presence would be helpful. I'm not that sensitive, and I think that would be a good idea, too. He leaned over to the intercom on his desk. Murray, have Cookson come into my office. Maurice Cookson had published several guides to large cents and half cents. I was pleased with his accessibility. Mr. Cookson also looked older than his photographs. I guess no one likes to look old, gentlemen. I have 12 special coins that I'm offering for sale. I hope to sell four of them today and keep the fifth for your consideration. The other seven I'll save for later. If today goes well, I'll offer them to you as well. I know it seems unbelievable, but I think six of the coins will fall under conditional census status. I'm sure Mr. Cookson will determine if I'm close or not. Since census condition cents don't come on the market very often, I was hoping you would be interested. Where did those coins come from? My grandfather left them to me when he died. I don't mean to insult Mr. Simmons, but this story is hard to believe. What can you show us? I spread four pictures on the table, each showing the obverse and reverse of one of the coins I was offering today. They were about five times the normal size and very clear. James and Maurice looked at each photograph for several minutes. Finally, James spoke up. What did you come up with for these four? A quick look at the results of recent auctions led me to believe that I could fetch about a million three for them. I thought it was one to one, but your figure is not out of the question. Maurice really knew his pennies. I only want $800,000 for the lot, but it has to be treated in a special way. James leaned back in his chair and smiled. I think we can handle it. How special are you talking about? I had a letter I took from the land trust explaining how to donate land. I gave it to Mr. Towers along with an advertisement for John Smurd's Orchard. I want you to buy this piece of land and donate it to the Madison Land Trust. The price is $600,000. You'll get a very nice tax deduction and become humanitarians. I'll take the rest of the money in cash. Give us a moment, please. James and Maurice retreated to the other end of the room. After a few minutes, Maurice left and James returned to the table. Do you have any coins with you? Yes, I also have a fifth coin that I would like to keep with you. Mr. Cookson returned to the table with a purple crown royal bag. This time he spoke, we are willing to honor your terms on the first part of the deal and hope you can honor ours on the second part. He then dumped the purple packet on the desktop. It turned out to contain almost 100 different coins, mostly gold but some silver coins as well. The retail price of this collection is around $300,000. For a number of reasons that we won't discuss, it's difficult for us to sell them. 
However, you won't have a problem. I understand that you have sold coins on eBay before, is that correct? I simply nodded. These coins inherited from your grandfather should sell easily and we will both benefit. I assure you won't have any difficulties. This was said with a slight wink. I thought about it for a while and agreed. I handed the four pennies to Mr. Towers and we all shook hands. Now, Mr. Simmons, tell us about this fifth coin. I held the photograph in my hand and looked at Mr. Cookson. Name the highest rated 1793 strawberry you've ever seen. I've never seen one, but I think the highest score is fair, 12. I rated this picture an 8, but I'm not a professional. He wasn't looking at the picture, he was looking at my face when I said that. Both of them were trying to see the photograph at the same time. Cookson was smiling broadly, and I could see dollar signs in Tower's eyes. How much? Best offer if you can figure out how to pay me. Would you like a cup of coffee, Mr. Simmons? Of course, Black would be just fine. They both left the room with the picture, and a few minutes later, a young woman brought me a cup of coffee. Mr. Uh, Towers will be with you in a few minutes. He has some phone calls to make. Will you be okay? I nodded in agreement and started the coffee. Thirty minutes had passed when Towers returned to the room with an absolutely beautiful woman. She had dark eyes, raven hair, and what appeared to be Middle Eastern looks. I guessed her to be no more than 30. She was well-dressed and had a commanding demeanor. For a second, I thought I recognized her, but I couldn't remember where from. Hello, my name is Letitia Rothberg. Do you have a passport, Mr. Simmons? Her voice was deep but still feminine. Yes, good. We'll be traveling to JFK shortly to set up a new offshore bank account for you. Do you have anything to give to Mr. Towers? I gave James a 1793 strawberry and he looked like a little boy at Christmas. Thank you, thank you, he said as he left the room. We never agreed on a price, but I still had seven coins that Towers wanted. Mr. Towers agreed to hold the small bag of coins until I returned. An hour later, Letitia and I were already sitting on a plane to the Cayman Islands. She hardly spoke at all. When we arrived at the airport, several photographers were eager to take her picture. She looked annoyed, yet she was smiling sweetly. I had no idea what the reason for this interest was. It was my first first-class flight, and it was over too quickly. A bright yellow mini SUV was waiting for us at the terminal. My hostess didn't hesitate to pull her skirt up to her hips as she slid into the driver's seat. To my embarrassment, she caught me sneaking glances at her tanned legs. She seemed amused by my discomfort. Twenty minutes later, we parked on the lower level of a mid-sized condominium building. Letitia Rothberg owned the whole building, but she used the top floor as her personal apartment. Can I get you anything, Mr. Simmons? A beer would be nice. The sight of her leaving the room was as good as the flash of her foot in the terminal. It's not in my nature to fawn over young women, but Letitia Rothberg was special. We went out on a small balcony overlooking the ocean. It was beautiful out there, but the wind was too strong for my taste. I guessed she was trying to impress me with the grandiosity of the place. It was beautiful, but I was more interested in the new bank account I was getting. You don't talk very much, Mr. Simmons. Surely you have a few questions you'd like answered. It seems strange to me that a woman of her class and position would drink beer from a bottle. I could imagine her sipping champagne or martinis but not beer. Such a figure would not last her long if she continued to. I usually think it's best to wait, but I guess you could tell me why we needed to come here to open a bank account. It's a simple, safe, and secure place to get money. I think it will work well for you. It's just one coin, yes, but you have seven more. I'm sorry, but that still seems excessive. To my delight, we return to the house sheltered from the wind. Can you accept this? I brought you here to be my sex slave for a few days. I have to admit that the unexpected comment made me smile. I automatically knew it was nonsense, but I still found humor in it. She had a sense of humor. She looked good and she was rich. What more could a man dream of? If only I were ten years younger. It's no good teasing an old man. We both laughed lightly at the situation. Come on, Mr. Simmons, let's go get some fresh lobsters for dinner. We finished our long necks and headed out the door. The restaurant and food were great. I didn't really like the wine the hostess chose, but I tried to be gracious. It didn't work. What's wrong with the wine, Mr. Simmons? Was I that obvious? I'm sorry, it was unintentional, a kind of reflex action. When I was 18, I got drunk on cheap white wine like a dog. I've never been so miserable before or since. Every time I smell or taste white wine, I vomit. 
I can't explain it. It's good wine, but don't worry about it. Five minutes later, we had two cold long necks. Oddly enough, there was little conversation during the meal. At the end, we each had a fruit sword bay and drank coffee. Tell me about yourself. Are you married? Do you have children? What do you do for a living? We have all night and I'm dying to know what brought us together. It's a lot of questions. I have two daughters, both of them are at Columbia University studying international banking or something like that. I don't really know, I just pay the tuition. It's interesting, I have a master's degree from Columbia University and I'm one of their guest lecturers. I got to meet both of them. Have you seen them this morning? We had lunch together. They hate it when I make them skip class. You must have gotten married early since you have two girls in college. That sounds like a phrase a guy could use. I felt comfortable with this Mediterranean beauty. I could have talked to her all night. I am currently estranged from my wife. That's a strange word I never thought I could use. She left me for a rich wheeler dealer. I think he builds shopping malls or business complexes. Anyway, he's got a fancy car and a big apartment. She told me she's decided to switch and the divorce will be final in about four weeks. That's a stupid reason to leave a good marriage. I guess everything was fine until she met this guy. I guess she was never happy with my choice of work. I had several opportunities to advance my career, but she refused to move forward. I wasn't thrilled about it, but decided it was necessary to save the marriage. Now I feel like nothing. And what do you do? There was an awkward pause. How do you tell a beautiful, rich, successful woman that you work as a grocery manager at a supermarket? She noticed my discomfort and reacted accordingly. It's not important. We can talk about it later. No, it's okay. I'm not ashamed of what I do. It's just that being a supermarket grocery manager isn't the kind of job that impresses the ladies. It doesn't bother my daughters, but my wife often purposely forgot to mention it in conversation. I could tell it was bothering her. Do you like what you do? Yes, and I'm good at it. The server brought more coffee and cleared the table. Mr. Simmons, I realize you've only known me for a short time, but I believe that first impressions are very important. Very briefly, what is your first impression of me? The question put me in an awkward position. If I answered honestly, I might push her away, and if I tried to butter her up, I was sure she would see right through it and think I was a liar. What to do? What do I do? In short, I see you as beautiful, intelligent, educated, and confident. Her head was tilted down slightly, and her eyes were looking up at me. I noticed a small smirk. I was hoping for candor. I'm sorry, but we were having such a pleasant evening, I didn't want to spoil it. Do you really have such a bad opinion of me? I don't want you to resent me. Maybe that's why your wife left you for another man. If you hadn't always tried to please her, your marriage would have been stronger. It was harsh, but I have to admit there was some truth to it. Miss Rothberg, I believe you are cunning and manipulative. You use your beauty and charm to get what you want. You are used to getting your way and I feel you are a bit of a spoiled brat. You play with men but are afraid of commitment. From the looks of it, you know how to make money and spend and invest it wisely. If you weren't so obsessed with wanting to prove that you're as good as any man, you'd probably make a good mother. I felt uncomfortable after saying that, but she made me angry with her comment about my marriage. For a few moments, we just sat there, staring at each other. Do you really think I'd be a good mother? The mood suddenly improved dramatically. During the short drive back to the condo, things were pleasant again. I knew she had heard everything I said but seemed to accept it without argument. She wanted the truth and I gave it to her. My night as Letitia Rothberg's sex slave turned out to be a little boring. It's hard to have sex in separate bedrooms. That's okay because I wasn't expecting anything anyway. The next morning, I got up first and found a breakfast of fruit danishes and hot coffee waiting for me along with a copy of the Wall Street Journal. The wind had died down and I enjoyed relaxing on the balcony overlooking the Caribbean. I could get used to this. Letitia joined me about 20 minutes later and jokingly snatched up part of the paper. We sat in silence, reading and sipping coffee as if we'd been doing it for years. I had known this woman for less than 24 hours, but everything about her was natural and comfortable. I'm afraid my phone doesn't work here and I really want to call my daughters. Letitia held out her cell phone to me. Be my guest. Cindy, it's Daddy. Where are you? Is everything okay? Cell phone says London. I'm in the Cayman and everything is fine. I just thought I should let you know since I didn't go straight home. I'm staying with a friend. I had to use her phone. They showed a picture of you on TV last night. 
They showed you getting on an airplane with Letitia Rothberg. What the hell are you doing with Letitia Rothberg? It's the friend I'm staying with. What's the big deal? Why are you with her? Everything's fine, nothing insidious is going on. I don't understand your concern, Dad. That woman is a barracuda, she eats men for breakfast. Letitia was bringing a tray of breakfast from the balcony as she walked by. I couldn't resist. This is my daughter, Cindy. She's in New York. She told me to be careful because you're a barracuda. Sure enough, Cindy heard me say this to Letitia and let out a loud groan over the phone. I could make out Cindy and Sandy discussing something quickly on the other end. Why are you there? How do you know her? When are you coming home? Before I could answer any of her questions, Letitia was already standing with her hand outstretched, waiting for me to hand her the phone. Hi, Cindy, it's Letitia. Your father told me about you and your sister. I'll be in New York tomorrow and would like to have lunch with you too. Where can I pick you up? Of course, there was no way I could have known the other side of this conversation. Who is this, professor? Pause. No problem. I'll pick you up from the classroom at 11. Okay, I'll tell you. Goodbye. Bye. Letitia gave me back my cell phone. Your daughter said goodbye. I'll have lunch with them tomorrow. I promise to be nice, even though they think I'm a fish. She giggled lightly and wiggled her ass and went to her room. An hour later, we were at the Federal Reserve Bank of the Cayman Islands. Under the experienced guidance of my hostess, I set up my first offshore bank account, and 20 minutes later, I saw that my new account had been credited with $4 million from Towers and Burns. I figured that was a fair price for 215 pennies. After dinner, she asked a friend to take us to feed manta rays. At dinner, I asked her why she worked for a firm like Towers and Burns and learned that she owned 60% of the company. What else can you tell me about yourself? Apparently, you're a major player on the GL financial scene, and I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know anything about you. I was born and raised in London. My father is Assyrian, and my mother is Turkish. I have an MBA from Columbia University. I am not married, but I have been engaged twice. I haven't had a serious relationship in over three years. I've learned not to trust men who show interest in me. I guess you could say I'm cynical, but I feel like most of them want something from me but have nothing to offer in return. That's unfortunate. I was hoping to get a ride back to the condo. Does that mean you don't trust me, you big jerk? I'm sorry if I came across as insensitive, I didn't mean to be. I guess it's hard for me to relate to your problem. I'll try to be better. Okay, let's relax, we have a party to go to. We ended the evening at a cocktail party at a major hotel. Everyone knew her and treated her like a celebrity. I spent the evening trying to remain even more inconspicuous than I was. I was still wearing the street clothes I had worn in New York. I had not supposed that I was to travel to the tropics. At first, Letitia seemed obliged to accompany me, but I persuaded her to enjoy herself and let me blend in with the tree where I felt comfortable. She did her best, but for most of the night, she constantly checked on me anyway. I found myself chatting with a couple of Hispanic gentlemen, cattle ranchers from Argentina. The conversation started with soccer and then moved on to fishing. At least the conversation was in English, I suppose, for my benefit. One of them remarked how attractive Letitia looked, not knowing that I was her chaperone for the evening. I felt a little flattered. My contribution to the chatter consisted mostly of smiles and nods. I wasn't knowledgeable enough about any of the topics to add anything of substance. Until Ramon Dwart brought up the topic of investments. He was interested in winter wheat. I listened as he explained in detail why he was going to invest a lot of his money in something he obviously knew nothing about. I got the impression that he was pretty rich and I was a little confused as to how he did it. I usually pride myself on having a poker face, but I guess I failed it at this time. Mr. Simmons, I can see by the look on your face that you disagree with me about investing in winter wheat. I was caught. I was supposed to remain invisible and inaudible. My invisibility cloak failed me. I'm sorry, Ramon. I'm afraid I'm not an investor and I don't understand the complexities of this case. I called him by his first name because I was uncomfortable addressing him formally. Maybe so, but I have a feeling you have an opinion on the matter. I'm going to pester you until you share it with us. I was trapped. I tried to feint a small smile. I need a fresh drink. For the next hour, the two gentlemen listened intently as an Alabama greengrocer explained that the excellent winter wheat crop in Alberta and Saskatchewan would more than compensate for the poor harvest in the States. 
The Canadian Grain Board has leased all available silos in North and South Dakota to store the surplus and has even reserved rail cars of grain for short-term storage. Within a week, winter wheat futures will begin to fall and will continue to fall until the market stabilizes. Both Canada and the States will be forced to unload wheat overseas. I was running out of clever words when Letitia came up. Ramon and his friend were flattered that she joined our little group and were genuinely surprised when she grabbed my hand and led me away. What the hell was that, Gary? We were just talking about food, about groceries. She smiled slightly at me as we left to head back to the condo. The next morning, we flew back to New York where a group of photographers was eager to capture her arrival. A courier from Towers and Burns handed me a small package containing the coins I had left behind. Letitia and I said our goodbyes and I headed to the commuter train terminal to fly back to Huntsville. The divorce and the sale of the house went according to plan. Phil Williams from the main office left me several messages asking me to call him. They again asked me to consider moving to the company's headquarters in New York, this time I agreed. John Smurd also left a message he wanted to meet for lunch. I tucked myself away in my locker at work and wished my shifters good luck. There was a picture in the paper of Clayton and Marcy at a barbecue for a local politician. They looked like the perfect couple. It took me a full day to scan and identify all the coins in the bag from New York. With three weeks to go, I decided to put them on eBay as soon as possible. Everything should be fine just as long as they didn't get caught by any scumbags. It took a full day to post the coin ads and prepare all the envelopes and blank stickers for shipping. All the money went into my PayPal account and from there to my new offshore bank. Now I had the weekend to relax. My Friday lunch with John Smurd was interesting. John was extremely pleased that I had gotten Clayton involved but was unhappy that I had gotten nothing out of the deal. Explaining that to him would have been too difficult. Lunch went fine and before he left, he gave me the deeds to five acres of land on the outskirts of town. He and his wife were leaving for Florida and he wanted to get the house in order before he left. No good deed goes unrewarded. Shortly after John and I parted ways, my cell phone rang. Cindy and Sandy were arriving in Nashville in two hours. I had plenty of time to pick them up. Airfare to Nashville was half the price of airfare to Huntsville and the girls were on a budget. I had no trouble getting there and picking them up. Cindy couldn't wait to talk about LSH. The lecture hall was hosting an advanced corporate finance course for over 300 students. In the middle of the lecture, the professor stopped to introduce Letitia to the students. She just appeared as if she owned the place. She spoke to the class for about 10 minutes and then announced that she needed two students for lunch at the Weston Hotel. We couldn't believe it when she called our names. So, you liked her. She's amazing, Dad. How the hell did you manage to meet her? Well, she said she was looking for a sex slave and I was her first choice. Sandy tapped me on the shoulder. This isn't funny, be serious. Okay, what did you talk about at lunch? She asked about our classes and schoolwork. Sandy chuckled lightly. She had a lot of questions about you. In fact, Cindy and I agreed that she was interested in more than just friendship. I'm 10 years older than her and a couple of dollars per. Hour. I'm sorry, girls, but she's totally out of my league. Daddy, she can have any man she wants. Why you? Think about it and give us a clue. From our point of view, you're perfect. But Letitia Rothberg doesn't know you like we do. Apparently, your mother didn't know me either. Everything went quiet for a few minutes. My remark about the mother sounded like a punch. It was not my intention to turn my daughters against their mother, and I regretted saying what I did. I'm sorry, girls, that didn't sound right. Your mother is a wonderful woman, and I have no right to say that. Don't worry about it, Dad. We understand more than you think. All was quiet for a few miles and then, just as we crossed the Alabama state line, Sandy's cell phone buzzed. Hello. We arrived about an hour ago. Everything's fine. You're kidding. That sounds great. I'll tell him. Thanks for the call. Bye. In the rearview mirror, I noticed Sandy giving Cindy the thumbs up sign. What was that? Sandy leaned over the front seat of the car. Guess what, Daddy? Letitia is coming to Huntsville. Tuesday morning. She said you have to pay her for the night and that she expects breakfast in bed. I was flattered to hear the news, but I felt pressured by Letitia and now my daughters. It all sounded wonderful and I hoped I was up to the task and not just this one. The weekend with the girls went great. They spent Saturday afternoon with their mom but didn't get to meet Clayton. I asked them not to mention Lesh. 
We sorted out all the things they wanted to leave at the house. By the time they left, we had it all sorted out. I made an upfront. As we drove back to Nashville, they made me promise to try to be companionable with Letitia. When I asked them what they meant, Cindy said, just don't make her mad. That was simple enough. They were excited about my move to town. I still didn't understand what Letitia needed from an old man who didn't even own an Armani suit. When I got home, it was time to relax with a beer and the Sunday paper. There were no pictures of Marcy and Clayton this week, but there was a short story about Keystone Development having trouble financing a local project. Winter wheat futures had fallen in value for a record time. This was interesting. I called Terry Davis and asked him to come over. It wasn't lunch, but I figured we could talk over a couple of beers. Clayton Manning had a mixed past, to say the least. For the past few years, he'd been either broke or in great wealth. He'd spent a lot of time moving to get ahead of creditors and friends who lent him money. His new project began to fail, the people and investors who supported him were disappearing. I don't remember beer ever tasting so good. Monday morning turned out better than one might have expected. The coins I put up for auction sold much better than I expected. Cookson estimated the value of the coins at about $300,000. It didn't look like they would go that high, but they may well have gone over $200,000. In a little over two weeks, I will be a free man. Three months ago, this would have seemed like a disaster, but today I was looking forward to it. The people who bought the house had negotiated the financing and were ready to close the deal. I thought it was funny that Marcy felt so comfortable with Clayton that she didn't need any of our joint possessions. I wondered if she realized how slippery her future was. At three o'clock, I had a meeting with the people who bought the house. A check for $200,000 went immediately into my offshore account. They had no objection to me staying in the house for another week. It suited both of us. The next morning, I received a phone call before I had even had my coffee. An unknown person officially notified me that Miss Rothberg would be arriving at 10.45 a.m. on Delta Flight 724. I arrived 30 minutes early. Yes, I was a little worried. Several paparazzi had gotten wind of her arrival and were waiting outside the terminal. I tried my best to be inconspicuous. I parked my car in the short-term parking lot because I wasn't expecting so much attention. Instead of waiting for me to pick her up, she chose to walk with me behind the car. Of course, the photographers remembered my license plate number and the cat jumped out of the bag. I'm not used to such a fuss, but Letitia didn't seem the least bit embarrassed by it. She apologized to me for it on the way home. I couldn't help but remember that as she was getting off the airplane, I wanted to kiss her. Stupid old man. I was embarrassed by the spareness of the house. Over the past few months, I had gotten rid of everything I could. The only things left were the necessities that the new owner had agreed to take responsibility for after I left. My guests seemed amused by my attempts to apologize. There was nothing in the house to eat, so we made a quick stop at the local Taco Bell, her choice. I promised her Dreamland ribs for dinner. It was nice to be around a woman with a healthy appetite. Letitia, I'm glad you're here, but I don't understand why. I assumed you'd be back to business. This is business, silly. I understand you're moving to New York next week. You need a place to stay and I have a spare bedroom. I'm here to help you pack. A truck will be here tomorrow morning to move anything you can't fit in the car. Just no furniture, please. How did you know I was moving? That's what I do. If I keep my eye on the little things, the big things come by themselves. It's a load of crap, but that's what I've always wanted to say. Are you conspiring with my daughters? I tried to grin innocently at that, but it was hard for an old man to appear sly. Her offer was unexpected, but I couldn't think of a single reason to refuse it. Sure, now let's get some boxes so we can pack. I thought she would have been more comfortable sitting in a boardroom or a bank somewhere, but she seemed to enjoy just talking to me but I still felt a little awkward about the age difference. We ended up throwing out more stuff than we had packed. She had an opinion about my closet and she refused to listen to my pleas for mercy. Once I was settled in New York, she promised to take me to the store to get some appropriate clothes. When we were done, there were more boxes than could fit in my car, but not enough for a moving van. I hoped she'd ordered a small truck. I set aside my laptop and a small inkjet printer to attend to an eBay auction. We were just getting ready for dinner when a new surprise awaited us. A delivery van was parked in front of the house. Letitia and I watched the driver, in a smart uniform, get down from the cab with a clipboard. Are you Gary Simmons? Yes, I have a delivery for you. Where do you want it? 
What the hell is this? It's from Mr. Ramon Dwart. Is there room in the garage? The spot in the garage where Marcy's Volvo used to be was empty. I pointed in that direction and nodded. I noticed Letitia put her hand to her mouth and giggled. I don't know for sure, but I think she was amused by my bewilderment. Five minutes later, I was looking at a shiny orange sports car standing next to my outdated Volvo. What the hell is this? With great pride, the courier said, this is a 2008 Lamborghini Gallardo Spider Superleggera model. Isn't it the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? Letitia could barely contain her laughter. She wasn't loud or anything, but she was definitely enjoying herself. I signed the shipping form for the fancy uniform to go home. I had no idea what I was going to do with my gift, but I knew I wasn't going to take it with me to New York. Get in the Volvo, Little Miss Funny Pants. My guest was still smiling as we pulled away from the driveway. I ordered a full rack of ribs and two fosters. Could you explain what's going on with the car? Ramon stocked up on winter wheat. Everyone thought he was crazy when the price started to drop. He started doubling contracts. In less than a week, he made over $40 million. He was happy with the money, but he was thrilled with the comments he received about his smart move. Well, good for Ramon. I hope he didn't mention my name. He wanted to pay his respects to you, but not without your consent. He thanked me for bringing you to the party and asked for your address. However, I didn't know he was going to do that. The ribs arrived and I watched amazed as Letitia dipped a few of them into Tabasco and then got down to business. God, I love that girl. You know I'm going to send it back in the morning, don't you? That's what I thought. Don't worry about it. Ramon won't take offense. He would have gladly offered you the money, but he probably figured you'd refuse. That way, you'll feel more obligated to keep the money. We had to order a few more beers because of the Tabasco. I felt good and didn't want to go home. At that moment, I would have given anything to spend the night in bed with this beautiful young vixen. I envied the suave, debonair, lovable guys who could get any girl in the world into bed in five minutes. The best I could hope for was a goodnight kiss. We couldn't talk all night, so eventually, I was forced to go home. The next morning was wonderful. All my worries were in vain. As soon as we entered the house, Letitia took me by the hand and led me to the bedroom. Since I was a true gentleman, I did my best to make sure her needs were met first. As a reward, I was rewarded with the best night of sex of my secluded life. Breakfast in bed consisted of juice, coffee, and Danish. I'm sorry, but under the circumstances, it's the best I can do. It's as good as I could have hoped for. Trying to eat off a tray in bed is very uncomfortable. After a few giggles and rearrangements, we retreated to the kitchen. Breakfast in bed sounds neater than it is, Letitia. I don't want to spoil the mood, but I'm really curious as to why you chose me. I don't have much to offer and you deserve so much. I've been burned many times by slick, desirable boy lovers. I won't fall into that trap again. Ah, oh, I see. I'm attracted to you because I'm not a trickster or a D asterisk asterisk K. My guest found this amusing and laughed a little. Gary, I was impressed with the deal you made with James in New York. I just sold some coins. Not that it's silly. I found your proposed agreement to purchase trust land intriguing. Do you consider me a philanthropist? Oh, not at all. I see you as a cunning bastard who took advantage of a unique situation to mess with his wife's lover. Of course, this brought a smile to my face. I was amazed at how smart she was and how well she hid it. Was that wrong? No, Gary, that was brilliant. I was impressed and wanted to know more about you. You couldn't possibly know what I was doing in New York. I knew what you did, but I didn't find out the reason until days later. You were checking up on me, of course. I'm not a fool. I have to admit the boost in self-esteem was refreshing. Unfortunately, Letitia was taking an early morning flight back to New York. I hated to see her go. She left me with a happy heart and the key to her apartment. The Lamborghini dealer couldn't come to collect the car until the next day. It was okay because I wasn't going to drive it. The movers came with a small truck and picked up my stuff to go to New York. Terry Davis called and told me that Keystone Development was in serious financial trouble. It seemed that Clayton had mysteriously lost almost all of its supporters almost overnight. There were rumors that some people were picking up markers that Clayton had not received. That evening I was visited by my almost ex-wife. To what do I owe this unexpected pleasure? I need to talk to you about some things. I'm leaving in a few days, but I'll help you in any way I can. I was going to take my old Volvo, but I noticed it was gone. What's that orange car in the garage? Things were starting to get interesting. 
I'm sorry, Marcy. When you said you didn't want your old Volvo, I sold it back to the dealer. He may still have it if you want to check it out. I'd never heard Marcy use that term before. The orange car was a gift, but I'm going to return it tomorrow anyway. I can't imagine myself driving something like that. The sticker on the window said $225,000. Who would give you a gift like that? Your new girlfriend? No, it was a cattle rancher from Argentina that I helped a few weeks ago. It was just to show my gratitude. So, what else can I do for you? There was a pause in the conversation. I realized that Marcy wanted to say something but didn't know how to do it. Would you like something to drink? I have beer and diet sodas. No, I can't stay long. How did you even get here? I don't see a car. I took a cab, Gary. You said you were leaving in a few days. Is it okay if I stay in the house for a while? The house is sold. We closed the deal yesterday and the new owners will move their stuff in this weekend. They're letting me stay until Friday, but that's it. What's wrong with the apartment by the river? She did not answer that question. There was a brief lull and then she asked, what happened to the money you got for the house? Things were getting really interesting now. I was starting to like that the conversation was getting on the right track. It's all gone. You clearly said you didn't want anything. The money I had, I used to set up a new apartment for my move. Where are you moving to? New York. I got a promotion and a big raise. I should be there on Monday. I wasn't going to tell Marcy that I was going to live with Letitia. I also wasn't going to tell her about the bank account in the Cayman. You never told me what happened to the apartment. It was only leased. The lease expired and the owner didn't want to renew it. Where do you live now? We're staying at the Holiday Inn until Clayton picks up a new place. Oh, I see. Now I understood why she wanted to move into our old house. Marcy looked a little confused. She wanted to ask for help but didn't know how to approach it. I realized she was in trouble. There was a lull in the conversation again. Is there anything else I can do for you? Could you give me a ride to the Holiday Inn? The first half of the trip went smoothly. I understand you have a girlfriend. Tell me about her. She's not really a friend, but more of a business partner. What kind of business? You're not doing any business. You're right. I'm just a grocery store clerk. I can't fool you, can I? Marcy was silent. She was looking out the window and I heard her whisper to herself, bastard. This was the moment when I could vent all my frustration. It was the perfect opportunity to let her know how much the pictures in the papers hurt me. But instead, I just smiled to myself. She was in a bad way and I redeemed myself. I felt bad for a moment, but it passed quickly. I dropped her off at the motel entrance. She left without looking back or saying goodbye. I hated to say it, but I felt a sense of satisfaction. The week was shaping up nicely. Thursday morning, I unexpectedly received the final divorce papers. They were early, but who am I to complain? On the front page of the Huntsville paper was a picture of Letitia Rothberg arriving at the airport. Your sincere friend was holding her hand. A copy of the newspaper is delivered free to each room at the Holiday Inn. Marcy can read it at breakfast. I was sure Clayton would explain to her who Letitia was. I emptied the safety deposit box at the bank. My seven pennies will come in handy in the near future. I thought Letitia would ask about them while she was here, but she never once broached the subject. All our conversations were strictly social. I set a buy it now price on all the coins in the auction. More than half of them were sold at that price. I spent the rest of the day packing up the coins that were sold and preparing them for shipping to the post office. The rest of the auction had to close by noon on Friday. If all PayPal payments went through, all coins would be mailed the same day. Any unscrupulous buyers will have to wait until Monday. Early Saturday morning, I was on my way. Most of the money from my PayPal account was transferred to my Cayman account. I also left a small amount on PayPal in case I saw something I just had to have. The people who bought the house drove up just as I was leaving. It was a win-win for both of us. The trip north would take about 12 hours with no delays. Letitia was in the apartment and promised to prepare a home-cooked dinner for my arrival. I wondered who would cook it. It was good to know that I was still man enough to win the heart of such a beautiful woman. I had no doubt that I could fulfill all her expectations. I was just crossing the Virginia state line on Interstate 81 when Cindy called. It seems Clayton Manning had skipped town and left Marcy with no car, no place to live, no money, and a hefty motel bill. I asked Cindy what she thought I should do. She laughed and replied, smile. 
Dear viewers, thank you for staying with us and supporting our channel. See you again.